Welcome. You're on the third day of a joint webinar organized by Franklin Templeton and Futu Singapore, the Moomoo Trading App. Now, I'm Oliver Higgins, and thank you for joining us again. Um, yeah, today we're excited because we've got quite a hot topic, riding the tech wave of 2022 and beyond. So get your notes ready because we're about to do an open discussion, and towards the end, as usual, we'll have the Q&A where you can fire your best questions for our speaker today, Eugene. Um, so for the past two days, just a recap, we covered investment implications of the Russian-Ukraine conflict. Um, and then we covered as well the outlook for global bonds. And today we're doing riding the tech wave. So I think, yeah, I'm anticipating a lot of questions. And if there's anything on your mind um, for Eugene today, uh, do fire away and we'll get to it at the end of the webinar. So thank you for joining us. And I think today really it's, it's a hot topic, but it's also a really important one because there are a lot of things that we can analyze um, in terms of key drivers for continued growth in the technology sector. And with Franklin today, uh, we're going to uncover and discover the opportunities for long-term growth so that you can you know, make decisions about your investment portfolio. So that leads me to my speaker for today, Eugene Lau, who is the Vice President of Financial Institutions of Southeast Asia. And now Eugene has over 15 years of pure asset management industry experience, uh, predominantly in retail business development and client servicing. And right now he's with the institutions team managing the retail distribution channels. Hi, Eugene. Hi, hi. Thank you for having right. me again. <laughs> Thank you so much. Now, could you tell the audience a little bit about yourself? So, well, you already shared my professional experience. So 15 years in the asset management industry, predominantly doing sales, client servicing. Uh, I've been through a, I've, I've been through a, a few fun houses and uh, I guess my the, the, my day-to-day -day job requires me of taking care of relationships with the, the various distributors of which uh, Futu uh, and Mumu is one of them. So we do seminars, we do trainings, we do fun updates uh, and we articulate the views uh, our house views as well as views of our products and we also provide solutions investment solutions to our distributors who will in turn provide these investment solutions to mm. the end clients so how would the audience today benefit from franklin templeton's analysis perhaps you could share a bit more on your background um okay so so let's let's just uh take a step back and then this this is the cue for me to start sharing my slides okay so now, who are we at uh, Franklin Templeton? So, uh, well, before that, let's just, let's just take a step back. Uh, can you guys see the slides? It should be coming up right about now. Okay, great. So, Perfect. our former executive chairman, once uh, Mark Mobius, once mentioned that what goes down usually goes back up if you're willing to be patient and don't hit the panic button. So this comment is very apt in today's current investment environment. So how, how do we approach investments uh, is something that you know, uh, a lot of people are very interested in. We have a lot of strategies in our suite of products, uh, but for, for the sake of simplicity today, we're just gonna talk about a little bit on technology. Uh, but before we go, go to that, uh, maybe I just give a little bit of brief introduction on who Franklin Templeton is. Uh, for those of you who have not tuned in for the past two evenings. Now, Franklin Templeton is one of the world's largest independent investment managers with over $1.5 trillion in assets. Now, we bring together an unmatched collection of independent specialist investment managers to provide clients deep expertise and boutique specialization across asset classes, investment styles, and geographies. Now, from large institutions to individual investors, each of our clients wants the same thing, and that's to achieve their financial goals. And for more than 70 years, we've helped them do exactly that. And everything we do at Franklin Templeton is focused on delivering our clients better outcomes. Now, we, we are present in 34 different countries uh, with more than 70 offices worldwide, and we aim to offer the best of both worlds, both global strength 
and boutique specialization. To be nimble where it matters, unparalleled in our ability to customize and guided by long-term value creation. So yeah, that's that's my two minutes worth of humble bragging. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so this is, uh, I'm not, I'm not gonna go into detail in all these slides. So there's a brief <laughs> introduction of what we do. Thank you so much, Eugene. So I guess let's go straight to today's topic. We're looking at riding the tech wave of 2022. So much in this field, so many buzzwords, so much. So let's break it down for the viewers watching. So my first question to you, technology stocks was the spotlight once again since the start of the pandemic. So why is this an important asset class in the first place? That's a very, very good uh, question to start with, uh, Olivia. And, and I got to start with this. See, when, when fund managers like us evaluate stocks, you know, one of the factors that we look into is earnings. And as a matter of fact, many tech firms have become, have become increasingly profitable over the past 20 years. Now, we, we feel that this inertia, the, the inertia of this profitability will continue for the long term. Now, the world has changed in incalculable ways since the start of the pandemic. Now, two phenomena have been especially notable to us at Franklin Templeton. Number one, the technological innovation has accelerated exponentially. And number two, there has been an increased awareness and concern about economic inequality. So that's something very interesting. Now, some believe that technological change is driving economic inequality. And we believe that innovation can, in fact, create more inclusive and equitable global economy with changes that will far outlast the pandemic and our recovery from it. Now think about it. Historically, bursts of innovation have often led to an initial increase in inequality as some skills become more valuable and better compensated while others become obsolete. But over time, innovation has frequently led to productivity and wage growth, resulting in broad-based higher living standards. Now, today, innovation is positively impacting all sectors, and this will eventually translate into longer-term corporate earnings for technology companies. And let's look at how healthy you know, the, the, the tech sector is in terms of leverage. Now, the total debt to capitalization ratio is a tool that measures the total amount of outstanding company debt as a, a, a percentage of the firm's total capitalization. The ratio is an indicator of the company's leverage, which is debt used to purchase assets. Now, IT companies, as you can see on this chart over here, relative to other sectors, are generally lower in debt. This translates to compelling balance sheet strength. Thank you for that. Wow, yep. I think um, that's a great opener for today. And I mean, just to zoom down into a hot topic for tech at the moment, the metaverse. Now, what's all that hype about, Eugene? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, well, the concept of the metaverse was probably best articulated in the movie Ready Player One. Now, if you haven't watched it, I highly recommend it. It portrays a future world where physical society has broken down and people live their lives in a virtual reality environment called the Oasis. Now, in the interest of time, I shall not go into too much detail about the movie. So if you, if you, if you do catch it, so please do catch it if you have not. It's one of my favorite movies and it is spot on on the definition of the metaverse. Okay, so, so coming back to the presentation. Now, let's take a step back and see what has transpired over the past two decades. And I know on the Moomoo app, you can, you can insert your comments, you can insert your questions. So let's take a poll right now with the audience. And how many of you in the audience over here has had a Friendster account. And if you do, type in in the <laughs> comment box, me, M-E, me. Me. <laughs> <laughs> so I how did. many of you here had a Friendster yeah. account? Now, some of you Gen Zs may not know what Friendster is, but let's just see how many people. Oh, awesome, awesome, great, great. Thank you so much. 
there's a lot of me's. <laughs> okay, let's go to the next question. Let's do another poll. How many of you have downloaded MP3s on Napster? Type I. <laughs> the alphabet I. How many of you have downloaded MP3s on Napster? Great, Let you great. Know in the moon. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and, and, and lastly, the, the, the last poll is how many of you have an ICQ account? If you do, please add me. My ICQ number is 2373-5643. <laughs> okay, uh, okay, that's just, just, uh, that just gave away my age. <laughs> so, now, so coming back to the presentation itself, the internet has changed exponentially. Now, I used to enjoy window shopping with my wife last time when we were dating. But now she just stays at home and collect coupons from Shopee and Lazada. <laughs> the only physical shopping that we do are our grocery runs to NTUC. I mean, the internet is no longer a place uh, for entertainment and information gathering. It's a vital platform for today's businesses. And before you visit a restaurant, you've got to check its Google ratings, whether it's three stars or four stars or four and a half stars. Before you apply for a job, you go to Glassdoor and you find feedback on the employer. Now, even modern day social media like Facebook has evolved. Now, the Gen Zs no longer use Facebook. Rather, they're obsessed with TikTok and Instagram stories, which is something I still can't comprehend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was just sharing, Olivia, before, the, before this, uh, this, this session began that I only learned how to do Facebook's, uh, sorry, not Facebook stories, Insta stories uh, just six months ago. Mm -hmm. So, okay. I, I'm really old, okay? That's, that's enough about me. <laughs> okay, moving on. So, we are witnessing a paradigm shift of business models. Now, every industry will need a metaverse strategy. And we are seeing a lot of disruptions that's happening right now in, in a lot of large businesses. Take, for example, Uber, Grab. They don't own any vehicles. If you look at Facebook, they don't create any content. Look at Alibaba, Shopee, Lazada. They have no inventory. And Airbnb, they own no property or real estate. And yet they're earning big bucks from, all, from, from, from their business models. So, so, so what is this telling us about uh, the new era and this new paradigm shift of business models? It's, it's going to be very, very promising. It's going to be very disruptive. And with a metaverse strategy, a lot of these new disruptive and new interesting concepts are going to materialize in the near future. All right. And we are in the era of digital transformation. Now, two years ago, nobody knew what Zoom or Microsoft Teams was. The pandemic was a catalyst for change. Now, sessions like today's presentation used to be conducted in person at a physical location with a buffet line of food served. Now, I usually enjoy the leftover buffet food that's meant for clients like yourselves after the seminar, but it looks like this is no longer going to be the convention with advancements in digitalization. And I had Subway for dinner, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so this is just the beginning, and the opportunities are massive. All right, mm -hmm. and, and, and to go in deeper uh, into this new concept, we, we are currently in a Web 2.0 environment. The concept of Web 3.0, which some of you may have read, may be a reality in the near future, and many tech companies are on track to actualize this. Now, while there is yet no standard definition of Web 3.0, it does have a few defining features. And one of the first features is decentralization. Now, decentralization will be a core tenant of Web 3.0. Now, take a step back. In Web 2.0, computers use HTTP, Hypertext Transmission Protocol. Okay, for those of you who, who, who don't know what HTTP is. Uh, yes, I was a computing science student. So, in the form of a, of a unique web address to find information, which is stored in at a fixed location, generally on a single server. Now with Web 3.0, because information will be found based on its content, it will be stored in multiple locations simultaneously and hence be decentralized. 
This would break down the massive data databases currently held by internet giants such as Facebook, Google, and it will hand greater control to users. Now, in addition to decentralization and being based upon open source software, Web 3.0 Web will also be trustless. What this means is that the network will allow participants to interact directly without going through a trusted intermediary. And it's going to be permissionless, meaning that anybody can participate without authorization from a governing body. As a result, Web 3.0 applications will run on blockchains or decentralized peer-to-peer -peer networks or a combination thereof. So again, in Web 3.0, computers will be able to understand information similarly to humans through technologies based upon seismic web concepts and natural language processing. Web 3.0 will also use machine learning, which is a branch of artificial intelligence or AI that uses data and algorithms to imitate how humans learn, gradually improving its accuracy. Now, these capabilities will enable computers to produce faster and more relevant results in a host of areas such as drug development and new materials, as opposed to merely targeting advertising that forms the bulk of current efforts. So, we, we believe that the most important question investors are grappling it with is, what is the durability of technology's growth in this increasingly post-crisis world? Is digital transformation done or is it just getting started? All right. Now, Franklin Templeton, we are squarely in the just getting started camp. And we see significant opportunities in digital transformation and its associated sub-themes including number one, artificial intelligence and machine learning, number two, new commerce, number three, software as a service or SAAS and secure cloud computing. Now, number four, digital media transformation and the metaverse, number five, digital customer engagement, number six, fintech and digital payments, seven, internet of things, eight, electrification and autonomy, nine, cybersecurity and 10, the future of work. So these are some of the sub-themes uh, that we have identified under the whole concept of digital transformation, all right? And this, this so-called, sorry, I'm going into geek mode at this point in time. So the so-called metaverse opportunity is perhaps the ultimate digital transformation application. With relevance to many of the sub-themes mentioned earlier, the metaverse is increased, it's interesting because it, it not only promises to create new, more immersive experience, but it also seeks to shift the balance of power from the major network operators to a network's user. Now, these implications of the statement are profound, and we believe for companies in the financial services, social media, and creator worlds, um, they have a lot of profound effect. And today, there is a growing handful of exciting public companies active in the metaverse. However, there is an even greater number of private companies that we are tracking very closely. And these companies are all seeking to build key elements of the metaverse across hardware, blockchain, fintech, social gaming, identity, AI, cloud computing, etc., etc. We think the metaverse heralds a multi-trillion dollar digital transformation opportunity of its own. And we believe uh, and, and which we believe will be solidly additive to the broader opportunity we have been talking about. So mm -hmm. that's my take on the metaverse. Wow, very comprehensive, Eugene. And I really yeah. like that point about the shift balance of power and the idea of going into a decentralized system. But just, you know, food for thought, um, and also from my perspective and what I've read on the discussion groups is, is it really going into a decentralized system? That is the direction that a lot of the companies that we are seeing uh, is headed towards. Now, mm -hmm. we don't know if it will materialize. I mean, mm -hmm. to, like, like what we discussed, the entire metaverse is at this point in time is still a concept. Mm -hmm. It has mm -hmm. not materialized yet. 
So, so thinking along the lines of Ready Player One, or, or for those of you who have not watched the movie Ready Player One, think along the lines of Pokemon Go. Think along the lines of World of Warcraft, Command and Conquer. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, <laughs> these are games where you're immersed in a universe and you, you, you are part of the universe. I, I used to be playing it, it, in my teenage years, and this is gi- again giving away my age, in my teenage years, I was playing Command and Conquer and I could be stuck in front of a computer for over 12 hours. Yeah, so, yes. so that's, that's how addictive uh, these concepts of metaverse are. And if it's applied positively to society, you can imagine the amount of potential it can bring, not only mm-hmm. to individuals, but also to businesses. Mm-hmm. And it's going to be the new arena of profiteering, of making money and putting our businesses on the web instead of a physical shop. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. So what are some of your comments about then valuation in the sector? Right. So so that's that's the topic which which a lot of people, uh, which we get a lot. So (laughs) IT sector companies, information technology sector companies have been traded at a premium to the broad equity indices for over... Uh, the past 30 years and remained above average in the late 2021. And whilst that premium recently fell due to market corrections back to you know pre-pandemic state, it's, so currently the valuations uh, of the tech sector is, is somewhere near the pre-pandemic uh, era stage. Okay? We continue to believe that such a premium is warranted given the strong and secular growth in the sector itself. Now, the acceleration of digital transformation as articulated earlier and the improving quality in the sector, uh, i.e. You know, the growing revenue, the growing recurring revenue sources through subscription models, strong balance sheets and strong overall uh, earnings margins uh, is going to benefit this sector and that's justifying its valuation. And despite the recent volatility tied to reopening, the market reopening uh, from COVID, you know, rising interest rates, increased inflation expectations, etc., we believe that the technology sector offers solid exposure to strong secular opportunities relating to digital transformation and its supporting sub themes. Mm. Right. Mm-hmm. So. What are some of the interesting aspects of technology-related stocks can we look forward to in this sense? Well, mm. well there, there is a lot. I mean, we have, we have evolved from the, 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 the tech bubble days since year 2000, the WorldCom and the Enron days, correct? Um, it's no longer... So these are companies with legitimate online businesses. And it's very interesting. And... Do pardon me, I'm going, I'm going into geek mode again right now. And I, I've seen some of the okay. comments on this. It's getting a bit kim. It's getting a bit uh, uh, dizzying. But do bear with me. But this is very, a, a very interesting topic. And I'm glad that you asked that. So that there are many sub-themes within technology that's actually worth looking into. And as mentioned earlier on, the pandemic has helped to accelerate investments in the work from home uh, uh, kind of environment. And it also is also helping workflow automation. So t- for example, companies such as Microsoft, a lot of us are using Microsoft Teams in our workplace uh, for video conferencing and for, for chatting with our colleagues and to talk, talk bad, talking bad about our bosses and stuff like that, right? So we, we use Microsoft Teams for that as a, as a business chat uh, a, a kind of platform. Some of us use a, a company called Salesforce. It's the market leading tool for client relationship management. And some of the companies uh, that, that, that you know, there's a lot of companies actually use this, this service called ServiceNow. Uh, mm-hmm. It's an American software company that develops a cloud computing platform to help companies manage digital workflows for enterprise operations. So these are some examples for the work from home kind of stocks. I'm moving on, you know, the artificial intelligence, machine learning kind of companies, for example, NVIDIA. NVIDIA used to, you know, produce some of the best graphics cards uh, for, for your CPU. They now produce graphics processing units for self-driving cars. So you have 
the, 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 the Teslas of the world, the Audis and all the, 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 the new China, China cars that have self-driving capabilities, they use graphics cards from NVIDIA. And supplying NVIDIA, we have uh, you know, TSMC, Taiwan Semiconductor, the world's most valuable semiconductor company, providing all these raw materials to okay. the AI ML enablers. And lastly, we have another good example is Google or, or Alphabet Inc. You know, they track every keyword you type into your computer and they track your movement via Google Maps. I mean, how crazy is that? <laughs> so <laughs> another sub-theme, you know, mm -hmm. e-commerce companies are changing the way we do shopping. And I already articulate this, articulated this earlier. You know, companies such as Amazon, Alibaba, your Grabs, your e-wallets, your Shopees, your, Laz your Lazadas, they're changing the way that we are you know, doing our purchases. And even luxury companies are starting to adopt online purchasing. You don't need to line up at a shop at Takashimaya just to you know, have, view your favorite new handbag. Digital media transformation, uh, examples, epic games, you know, a leading game designer responsible for games such as Final Fantasy, Assassin's Creed. You have Netflix changing the way we watch movies. Uh, I mean, some, some of the major uh, blockbuster movies are no longer released in cinemas. Instead, they're released on Netflix. And it's offering a paradigm shift of watching television. And of course, another good example is Adobe, uh, a content creation software and measuring services, which a lot of us are familiar with. We also have fintech and blockchain-related companies. You know, credit card companies such as Visa, Mastercard, they're starting to adopt blockchain-related uh, blockchain uh, technologies. You have PayPal and you have e-wallet companies that's rising. In Singapore itself, when you go to, to the shopping centers, when you go to even to the hawker stores, they are starting to accept so many e-wallet kind of companies, your Faith Pay, your Grab Pay, your PayLa Pay Now, and a lot more other companies are, are into this e-wallet game. And that is a very, very promising uh, aspect of adoption of technology. Mm -hmm. Internet of Things, 5G-related companies. We talk about telco companies developing you know, the fifth-generation uh, mobile technology. So companies such as T-Mobile, Crown Castle, which are the guys that build the infrastructure for cell phone towers. We also have hardware manufacturers such as your, you know, your Teslas that produce your electric cars and Sonos that produce some of the best quality sound systems uh, for home entertainment. And if you think about it, the potential for Internet of Things and 5G-related devices per person is staggering. On average, a single person owns 0 0.3 PCs, 1.2 mobile phones, and over six IoT devices, for example, like your Bluetooth headsets or your home control systems. Imagine what the figure will look like in the next 10 years. It's mind blowing, <laughs> okay? And uh, I guess this will be the last slide for, to address this question. And there's also a call for green vehicles. And this is driving the exponential development of electric vehicles and autonomous tools. So companies such as your Teslas are, benef are benefiting from this call. Uh, some of the battery manufacturers around the world are, are, are you know, uh, they are benefiting from this call. And some of the commodity providers uh, offering the raw ingredients, uh, the, so the raw materials uh, to build all these complex machinery are also benefiting from, from this new initiative. So yeah, these are some of the interesting concepts or, or rather uh, sub-concepts related to technology that uh, we are very excited about. Mm. Thank you for that, Eugene. I mean, I have a question. So for Singapore, we're trying to, you know, devise this smart city vision. And I think a lot of places are trying to do that. Uh, what do you think about Singapore's future in this, or at least the potentials in the sectors? Well, from a Singapore point of view, um, there, there are a lot of, of companies that are trying to adopt this. And, and I've given some examples, like for example, Shopee, Grab, uh, they're all based in Singapore. Uh, but a lot of these companies, they also have backing from the foreign companies. Mm -hmm. We don't know if there's going to be m and in the future. We anticipate there will be. Mm -hmm. And with NMA, there, there, there comes a lot of opportunities for, from an investment point of view. Uh, 
uh, usually M and A companies when they get acquired, you know, sometimes the return on equity for for people holding their stock might be higher. Sometimes it may not be. This is something which 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 we we uh, we wouldn't know until it happens. Correct. Um, in in terms mm-hmm. of enablers in Singapore, I think we we don't see a lot of local companies yet that are you know participating in this game. We see a lot of them coming out from China. We see a lot of them coming out from the United States. But here's the interesting part. What is the difference between the large tech companies in China versus the large tech companies in the United States? Well, of course, large tech companies in the United States, some of them have a longer track record, like your Apples, your Microsofts, uh, your NVIDIAs, they have a longer track record. Some of the large tech companies in China, like your Alibabas, Tencents, Meituans, uh, they are fairly new to the, the global audience. But on top of that, China has a regulatory risk. The government likes to have some control over these people. Um, that's that's why that's the difference between the, the, the China tech companies investing in a China tech company versus investing in a US tech company. So some food for thought down there. I, I'm not going to say whether or not you know China is bad, US is good, or US is bad, China is good. But there's some food for thought for you. Uh, either way, you know the we are coming into an environment where there's a lot of decentralization, like what I mentioned earlier. So it doesn't matter whether or not this stock or company is going to be dominated in Singapore, in China or the US or any other parts of the world. There's going to be, uh, you know, comparative advantage. There's going to be outsourcing. There's going to be leveraging on ideas, sharing of ideas. Uh, and whatever Singapore is doing, I feel that it's in the step in the, di- in the right direction. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm personally invested in like quantum computing and social robotics. So I, I liked uh, that outlook in those different sectors that you brought up. So thank you for that. I think the audience also benefited from that. So I guess leading into the next question, how then can the Fun House or Franklin Templeton um, help to achieve this investment objectives in technology? Thanks, Olivia. Glad you asked that. So uh, here's, here's my five minutes of uh, shameless brag again. Uh, so Franklin Templeton has an investment solution to help meet the demands for a technology product. And that's called the Franklin Technology Fund. Now, the Franklin Technology Fund deploys the following rules, R-U-L-E-S, in their investment approach. Now, R for resilience. We have a competitive advantage against the benchmark and the peer group. And it has achieved a historical standard deviation of about 20% per annum. Now, when it comes to investments, it's very important to to, to look at something called standard deviation, which also uh, means how much volatility are you going to expect from your investment. Now, to put things in perspective, you know, if you buy into investment grade bonds, you would expect a standard deviation of about 3 to 6%. You buy into high yield, you're going to anticipate standard deviation of between 6 to 12%. If you buy into a diversified Asia-Pacific equity portfolio, you would anticipate a standard deviation of between 12 to 15%. And if you buy into a thematic portfolio, like a tech, a tech fund, you are going to expect a standard deviation of between 20 to 50%. So that's how much it will swing. Now, mm-hmm. the Franklin Technology Fund historically has historically has a standard deviation again of about 20%, which is on the lower end of the spectrum of volatility amongst the technology peers. So that's resilience for you. We are unbiased, 64% active share with a 10% allocate, allocation into small and mid caps. And this 10% allocation includes about 5% in private equity. And this is a very, very unique structure when it comes to unit trust funds investing into technology. So what does this mean? What does all this figure mean? 64% active share means that versus the benchmark, uh, we, we, we are differentiated. We are 64% different from what the benchmark has to offer, which means we don't track the benchmark very closely. And that's how we generate alpha for the portfolio. And a lot of tech funds have a massive allocation into your mega tech, uh, your, 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 your mega cap kind of uh, companies. But for us, we prefer to buy into the mid-range large caps uh, or the low range large caps. And we also explore the mid cap and the private equity space. And that gives us a competitive advantage to identify a lot of startup companies that are playing 
that they, they are starting to engage themselves uh, in the metaverse concept, right? Um, mm -hmm. The next alphabet, L, longevity. So you have R, you have U, you have L, longevity. We have more than 20 years of track record and it has a morning star rating of between, toggling between four to five stars historically. And lastly, the last alphabet, E, ESG. Uh, we are embedding ESG into our investment process. A very good example is if you notice our holdings, we do not hold Facebook or, or not also known as Meta in our portfolio at, at, at this point in time. And this is because of ESG concerns. Regardless whether or not Facebook is doing well on a stock level, the stock prices are going up, people are profiteering from it. But based on the social issues that Facebook has generated over the past couple of years, all the fake news, all the cyberbullying and stuff like that, we are no longer comfortable uh, in holding such a company within our portfolio itself. So from an ESG point of view, it's something that we, we, we don't hold. Now, just to give you a better illustration on, on, on what the portfolio consists of. Now, it's a portfolio of 120 stocks with the top 10 holdings constituting to almost 30% of the portfolio. Now, many, many familiar names you can see uh, in the top 10 holdings. Microsoft, Apple needs no introduction. Amazon needs no introduction. NVIDIA, graphics processing unit company. Uh, ServiceNow, American software company that develops cloud computing to help companies manage digital workflows for enterprise operations. Uh, MasterCard and Visa, your credit card companies that need no introduction. Alphabet is the parent company for Google. Workday, uh, this is an American on-demand cloud-based financial management and human capital management software vendor. And lastly, we have uh, Atlassian Corporation, and this is a UK domiciled American Australian originated software company that develops products for software developers, project managers, and other software development teams. So it's a software that develops other softwares. Right. So this this is just a flavor of what we have on this product uh, that enables you to have the exposure to digital transformation. And we feel that in the long run, uh, these are the stocks that will benefit in this uh, new adoption of, of, of technology as we move into 5G mobile networks, as we move into Web 3.0, as we move into the metaverse, right? So some performance figures over here, which I will not go into too much detail. And so in summary, why technology? So we've, we've spoken a lot uh, uh, over the past 40 minutes and, and do, I do apologize if I went too much into geek mode and I do apologize if it was too, too, uh, too comprehensive. Now, just to summarize it in three simple points. Number one, digitalization is happening and there's massive opportunities for long-term growth. Number two, we have Franklin Templeton. We have a proven tra track record and competitive advantage amongst peers. And thirdly, this product offers a unique diversification into tech sub themes and private equity markets. And this makes our product a market leader. All right, so that's, that's it for me. Thank you so much, Eugene. I think uh, open discussion, I think the comprehensive part is, is great. <laughs> so keep geeking out because I think the audience loves it. I, I learn a lot from it as well. Um, all right, so we'll, we'll get back to you in a second because we've got quite a lot of questions coming in for Q&A. So mm -hmm. keep them coming for Eugene. I'm sure you'd like to ask him a lot of questions. But before that, I'm just gonna give you a short live demo on how you can, fund, you can find the Fun House in-app. So just bear with me for about five minutes. You've heard such analysis, right? But how do you exactly get first access to a Franklin Templeton's fund? So if you have your Moomoo app with you, uh, I'll just show you very quickly how you can navigate the funds in app. So when you first enter the app, it will look like this. You look for Money Plus and you click on Fund Houses on the top. You should be able to see Franklin, and we're going to use Franklin for today's webinar. So you click on the icon, and you can see the full listings of the funds run by them. And over here, you'll have the full comprehensive data on what you'll need to know about Franklin Templeton, what it entails. You have the fact sheet, 
the performance and the subscription details. So I think this part is really important because it gives you the general profile. You've got the NAV, the net asset value, you can calculate the change in price. And I think, you know, it's a good general overview, but if you do want to go into details, you can just navigate underneath down to position details. So over here, I personally use it because you'll be able to assess the weight of each instrument, the performance, the type of region and sectors that they're involved in. And if you do want to complement it with a separate tool, you can go under subscription. And under here, it will help you gain a better understanding about the fund houses strategy and overall concept. Now, for my personal favorite, the news feature, I think it's an excellent tool because you can stay on top of the keywords um, and the buzz surrounding the fun house. Um, and I think it's, it's pretty much the entire composition across all media channels um, and click each article for further details. Now, if you have any questions about this feature, uh, do message our team anytime and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Now, I would like to invite Eugene back into the room because we're onto the best part of the webinar, which is the Q&A. So you've, you've listed down your questions for him. So we'll start with the first question, Eugene. As the tech stocks often have sharp ups and downs, how do we keep our faith in it? <laughs> LOL. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, to begin with, you have to understand how you want to asset allocate in your mm. portfolio. So if you are an aggressive investor from a portfolio allocation point of view, you would want to have about 100% in equities. Um, some of you would like to have 50% in technology and the rest of them in a diversified pool of global equity funds. For the conservative bunch of you, you might want to asset allocate maybe 60-40, 60% equities, 40% bonds, or rather 60% bonds, 40% equities. It's up to your own personal preference. But consider this, technology, as what I mentioned earlier on, is going to be a theme for the future, and it's not going to die away. It's not going to die away like, like, like uh, some of the other themes or thematic portfolios that we have seen pop up uh, over the past few years. So... You have to consider when you asset allocate to tech, you have to be prepared for that level of volatility. Mm. You, you don't go to Burger King, order a Whopper and say, what, this one has beef? I mean, it's, it's, it's something that you have to expect uh, and anticipate and you have to understand why it behaves in this manner. It behaves in this manner is because of its high earnings, its high valuation and because it's more volatile, it tends to sell off uh, very steeply and it tends to also gain very steeply. So I mentioned to you earlier, a typical tech fund uh, would have a, a standard deviation or volatility profile of approximately 20 to 40, 50%. Now, some of our peers in the industry uh, have, um, have, have, have funds that you know, have an annualized standard deviation of over 50%, and they're very, very heavy in Tesla. And if you have that kind of weight in a one particular stock, like let's say 10% in Tesla or 10% in, 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 in Microsoft or Apple, and when Apple stocks plunge, Microsoft stocks plunge, you will have to anticipate that fund to plunge in the same magnitude. All right. During the COVID period in 2020, I, I put in some money into a portfolio of tech. So 20% of my portfolio was in tech funds. So I buy into funds only. And in three months, I made 30%. So that's on average 10% a month. So that's how, um, uh, that's how volatile uh, a tech sector alloc allocation uh, can be. It will work for you. But imagine this. After that period of time, tech tumbled. And in fact, I was pretty lucky. I took out uh, when I hit 30%. So I took my profits. I got out of tech. I re-entered into tech again sometime earlier this year. And now my funds are down 20%. And that's, that's earlier this year. So it's, it's only March. So that's only two months worth of investments and I'm down by 20%. So, so it's something which I, as an investor, you have to anticipate, appreciate, 
and digest if you want to get your hands onto technology. So mm -hmm. it, based on what I shared with you, you know, the, the, the prospect of, of what technology investments, the companies that are participating in the digital transformation. And if you believe that, you know, this is going to be the future of what uh, our lives are going to be, how society is going to be, and how businesses are going to be, then do consider having a tech allocation in your portfolio. And if, if you fully understand and appreciate what these companies are going to do in the future, only then can you understand how the allocation in your portfolio will behave and how it will benefit your investment needs. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. So yeah. speaking of Web 3.0, right? We go back to Web 3 and we've got some questions related to this. And, I, and I'll just uh, put in my own thoughts about it. I know there are several articles by Niantic themselves that sort of painted the metaverse as a dystopian nightmare. Um, so a viewer would like to know, um, you've mentioned the benefits of it, but what are the downsides of Web3? Well, downside, um, everything that has to do with Terminator 1, Terminator 2, Terminator <laughs> 3. Um, yeah. <laughs> so Skynet takes over, you know, the, 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 the cyborg will take over the world. So that's the downside of Web 3.0. I'm, I'm just kidding. Uh, as it stands at this point in time, Web 3.0, the metaverse, it's still a concept. Now, mm -hmm. a lot of people, a lot of doomsday predictors will come up with a lot of scenarios and assumptions that, you know, a lot of things can go wrong. They post this content on your Facebooks, they post it on, on, on social media, you get a lot of likes, they post YouTube videos, they get paid for it. It's entertaining. But mm -hmm. nobody knows how much bad can happen or how much good can happen either. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What we do know, this is the correct step. Uh, in evolution of the internet, correct? So we talk about decentralized networks, adopting a blockchain technology. And even in fund management business like, 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 like ours, we are adopting uh, smart beta portfolios. You know, portfolios that are run not just by a human fund manager, but, but being assisted or even fully applied by an algorithm. So mm -hmm. things are evolving and, and we, we would never know what benefits it will bring or what... Uh, harm it will bring. When Facebook first started off, everybody and we added photos and, and all that stuff. We posted stuff on our, we gave testimonials on, on our friends. I um, mean, we, 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 we shared photos, we tagged people. But nowadays, you know, people don't do that anymore because it's, it's, they will use it for, for ne more, more, more negative use. I mean, they, they spread fake news, you know, they, they, they blackmail people from Facebook. None of us knew that this would happen to Facebook, correct? Mm -hmm. Facebook was meant to be a positive tool, but it evolved into a platform where a lot of people use it for negative means and for cyberbullying, and that translates to you know, teenage suicides and all that stuff. You know, th th there are a lot of things that can go right, and there are a lot of things that can go wrong. So mm -hmm. back to the question is, uh, what are the benefits that Web 3.0 uh, can bring? I already articulated it in my, previous pres in, in my presentation earlier on. But what harm would it bring? I don't think I, I, I know enough or rather I want to speculate or assume that all these bad things will happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Absolutely. If you're more, yeah, so, so again, if you are more on the pessimistic side, yeah, anything that happens in Terminator 2, Terminator 3, you know, <laughs> yeah, that, that's what may happen, you know, Skynet takes over. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think also a lot of the discussion has to do with um, whether people are ready for that advancement. You said it, the evolution yeah. of tech is amazing. And I'm, I'm a futurist myself, but sometimes I guess the receiving end of that might not be ready for that evolution. So I, right. it's a very interesting uh, concept. And uh, yeah, very excited to see what the future brings. Um, an extension to this question, based on your own views, what is the outlook of the metaverse being materialized in the near future? And I think they're referring in particular to cryptocurrencies. And how long do you think the tech will be ready for mass usage? Mm. Okay, for cryptocurrencies, uh, to be honest, our company... Uh, generally, we don't buy directly into cryptocurrencies uh, for, for reasons that uh, we feel that it's a very volatile asset class. 
Uh, there's no regulation in cryptocurrencies and there's a lot of gray gray areas and 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 we, we prefer to avoid cryptocurrency at this point in time but that's not saying that we are gonna uh we're not gonna adopt it like forever i mean we gotta let it mature for a while more and see whether or not there are legitimate investment opportunities in cryptocurrencies but as it stands at this point in time uh there are a lot more uh, uh th th there's a lot of benefits in cryptocurrencies but there's also a lot of criticisms in crypto in cryptocurrencies. Mm, I was just watching a news clip on Channel News Asia this afternoon. Uh, they were interviewing uh, the, the, some somebody in Thailand on on Thai businesses adopting cryptocurrency. And one of the things that's very interestingly mentioned was, uh, you know, taxation. I mean, how how a government's gonna the the tax the use of of using cryptocurrencies as their primary form of currency exchange for their businesses. Uh, how, how is regulation going to come in? Uh, you know, a, a lot of negative use of cryptocurrencies are actually happening at this point in time. Money laundering, you know, criminal mm. proceeds are all dumped into cryptocurrencies because of its decentralized network. And because it's non-regulated, you know, there's no way uh, the, the, the authorities can clamp down on, on such an asset class. Uh, whether or not it will bring... Uh, what, what are our views about it? we will wait and see at this point in time because it's, it's a highly volatile asset class. And even, even in Singapore, the MAS has also applied restrictions in, mm -hmm. in trading cryptocurrency. Speaking of which, cryptocurrency, blockchain technology, NFTs even, as it stands right now, the fundamentals relative to conventional stocks, conventional bonds, I mean, there, there are not much fundamentals behind it at all from that relative perspective. And a lot of it is driven by trading, by demand and supply. So that's what's driving the volatility of your NFTs, your, your cryptocurrencies. And this is something that you have to tolerate uh, as, you know, because it's, it's now in the infancy stage, right? Cryptocurrency. We have yet to fully understand its potential. We have, to, we have yet to fully un understand or fully uh, see how much it can apply in our conventional business models. So mm. that's my personal take, actually. Uh, but from a, a from a, a professional take on cryptocurrencies, we do not uh, invest into it. We do, however, invest into companies that adopt all these enablers, that, that, that adopt blockchain technology, that adopt digital transformation. So at least there is a tangible factor in these companies. We can see their balance sheets. We know who the management are. We can see their products. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a physical office. You know, we are more comfortable in that sort of investment rather than an investment that has little to no fundamentals. Mm -hmm. I hope that answers the question. Excellent. Yes, it yeah. does. Um, and uh, I guess the next question is more contextualized. They want to know about the Chinese tech industry. Um, and we, we did touch a bit on this, but I guess overall, they want to know, uh, what is your view on the Chinese tech industry, Eugene? Well, it's a force to be reckoned with, like it or not. It is a very big force to be reckoned with. Mm -hmm. And the only downside is the regulatory risk. I mean, we all saw what happened with Jack Ma. Uh, speculation aside, we're not going to talk about that. But uh, I mean, Alibaba it was a bohemoth. It was it was it was massive. Uh, Alipay was massive, and 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 Meituan also was massive. Other companies, the big tech companies in China, they were all they were all changing the way how China does their business, right? But eventually, you know, government intervened. They put a stop to a lot of stuff. A lot of online gaming. They put a stop to, to online tuition, uh, and that has impacted the, the 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 growth potential of all these companies. They just wanted a little bit more control. Now, whether we like it or not, uh, they are indeed a force to be reckoned with. They are large companies. They have a huge inertia, correct? And if you know regulations are still going to come in to stop this and stop that, they will find a way to maneuver around it but it's not going to happen so soon. Mm -hmm. um, in our perspective, I mean, in my personal perspective, we feel that the, the, the regulatory risks still remain. Um, there's a lot of uh, controls by the government which hinders private 
uh, uh, sorry, of public listed company growth mm. from all these uh, private companies. So that, that, that's, that's something which we have to take note of when we buy into Chinese tech investments. Um, but if you ask me, there is a huge potential for Chinese tech companies and, and, and the peripheral companies that are supporting Chinese tech. Take, for example, electric vehicles. I mean, electric vehicle companies, I mean, Tesla is, is the biggest in the US, but there are so many new ones uh, that's Absolutely. popping out in, in, in China. I mean, you have BYDs, you have mm-hmm. NEOs. Uh, exactly, about to bring that up, yeah. Yeah, you, you have companies like your D, uh, the, the D, 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 DJI, uh, the, the drone operators, right? All these are operating out of China. And on top mm-hmm. of that, you have your battery manufacturers, your mm-hmm. CATLs, Contemporary Amperex Technologies, EVE Energy. And they're right? key parts of that. They, they are the suppliers for the batteries for all these cars. Mm-hmm. And... And, and if we talk about battery manufacturers, it's, it's, it's very, very exciting because take, for example, EVE Energy, um, it's working together with an Israeli company by the name of Stordot to produce a fast charging battery that will charge a car up in less than five minutes from zero to 100. And it's in the prototype wow. stage at this point in time, correct? CATL, uh, Contemporary Amperex Technology, has recognized that lithium it's a very expensive raw material to be used in battery production. So what did they do? They experimented with sodium, which is found in our everyday table salt. So they've produces, they, they have successfully produced a sodium ion battery. And it's now in the experimental stage as well. So imagine the, the, these peripheral companies uh, and these, these Chinese tech, and these companies are all based in China. Imagine the amount of contribution to innovation uh, they can offer to uh, the global tech arena. But then again, you know, there is that regulatory risks. So, so you got to take it. If you do buy into Chinese tech companies, you know, you, you got to be prepared for, for these, uh, these regulatory risks uh, that are that, that they're still being seen at this point in time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So last question, Web3 is all about decentralization and anonymous, anonymous behavior. So this is something contrary to the current big tech companies who want control. Do you agree with this, that current tech companies just want control? I guess it's really about, the question is really about the decentralized system and intentions for it. Um what are your thoughts on this, Eugene? Well, if everybody's headed towards uh, decentralized models, then you know the, the control will slowly fade away. Uh, the control that we are seeing right now from your Microsofts, your Googles, your How Apples, do we your that? I mean, Apple owns like I mean they own Apple TV, the iPhones, your iPads. Uh, you have an Apple uh, Apple ID, which is which takes forever to reset if you forget your password. Uh, even your Samsungs you have uh, are all enabled by by Androids and that's powered by Google. And Google is powering all the PCs and all the 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 the, the, the other peripheral uh, businesses that they have. You they 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 own WhatsApp. They I mean sorry. Um, yeah, Facebook Meta. They own Instagram. They own WhatsApp. Correct. There there is a, we are living in an era the Web 2.0. 2.0 era where control is is being held by all these companies. Uh, like it or not, this is still going to be the case for the near term. But imagine 10 years down the line when, when society, when culture adopts a decentralized environment and when, when technology has advanced to the point where decentralization becomes a norm, mm-hmm. then you know companies that used to be in control uh, will have to find ways of diversifying their business. It is something that they will have to anticipate. I mean, the, the, the whole issue of fake news, we all saw it the past few years. Um, when Facebook was called uh, to, to, I mean, to in front of Congress, I mean, Mark Zuckerberg was interviewed in front of Congress, uh, in front of the judges uh, on, on what is he going to do? Uh, with all these fake news that's 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 on his platform, mm-hmm. I mean, no, nobody would have knew, nobody would have known that you know Facebook will become the hub yeah. of 
you know, fake news of of negative uh, sentiments and, and all that stuff. Nobody knew. You're referring so to the Cambridge Analytica case, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to say is that a lot of things evolve at a very fast pace, especially in the tech industry. Uh, we, we wouldn't know uh, how it would, it would span out. Maybe, you know, 10 years down the line, you know, there'll be full control by some of these companies. But, we also, but you know, we're hoping it won't be that case. If not, they'll just have control over all our lives. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm off the school of thought that you know, everything will be decentralized and these companies will be forced to diversify their business. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we, we have seen that you know, in, in, in history in, over the past 20 years. We thought downloading MP3s on Napster was, 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 was okay. But it turned out it was not okay. Uh, and and it, it is examples like this uh, that you, we have to anticipate, you know, the evolution in tech is going to be very fast paced. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that. And thank you to the audience for all your great questions. Um, looks like that's all we have time for today. But Eugene, do you have any final thoughts for our viewers out there? Sure. Uh, on the topic of tech, I mean, it's, it's, it's something that everybody will have to embrace, like it or not. Uh, but if you are going to invest into technology, you got to choose a manager that you're comfortable with. You got to choose a strategy that you're comfortable with. Uh, and at the end of the day, you have to understand the product that you're investing to. Take some time to read on the platform. Now, Mumu, the, the Mumu app itself is very comprehensive. There's a lot of information on the application that allows you to to do your own homework and it helps you to make your investment decision before clicking on the button to invest. So make a wise investment, do your homework, understand what you're buying into. Only then can you appreciate how your investments can work for you in your portfolio. I think that's the best advice I can give to anybody uh, on the Mumu platform at this point in time. Amazing. Thank you so much, Eugene. Now, the, for the audience out there, thank you for joining us for the past three days. And remember, we're always here to provide you with the educational tools to help you make better investment decisions. Now, if you missed out on the past webinars, you can always head over to our YouTube page or re-watch them on the Mumu app. And if you have any other follow-up questions, do email our team and uh, follow our socials if you want to keep up and stay up to date with more webinars coming um, soon. So we'll see you for the next one. Um, thank you so much, Eugene. Once again, I'm Olivia Higgins and we'll see you next time. Bye. Take care, stay safe, and may you, may you achieve your investment objectives with Franklin Templeton. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.